Hi guys, my name is Pierre Tanius. I am a sophomore at Vanguard University and my major is Theology, Emphasis in Pastoral Leadership. I'm, um, I always felt um, called to ministry and um, I just want to serve the Lord all the days of my life. So let's get this started. I'm sorry if I keep looking down because I'm just kind of focusing on the notes that I have so I can just kind of be in order. So to start off, I was born in uh, Saudi Arabia, capital city of Riyadh. Um, all my family uh, was born in from uh, was born in Egypt, um, and so I'm actually like an Egyptian, but I was born in Saudi Arabia. Um, being born in Saudi Arabia just made me feel like I am different than. Um, everyone else especially being raised there um as a christian quote 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 unquote christian um um i always felt just very alone and left out from the community that i was around in school um just everywhere but it was mostly school because that's where that's where friends were and that's where people were so I um I always struggled with the um with the idea of being left out and the idea of being different. And that brought that brought a lot of anger inside of me and it brought so much bitterness um inside of me towards people, especially people at school. And so I remember being a very aggressive kid and being very violent and I used to get in a lot of fights I know some people will be disappointed or not disappointed but they kind of be shocked with that idea but I used to get in a lot of fights I used to just um just struggle with being left out and I felt like the only way people could acknowledge me and the people that people could see that I am there and that I am not different in a way was by bullying by just being aggressive by by doing all all of these aggressive things so that i am able to be respected and as i even started to realize and as as i started even to progress through the 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 whole ag aggressiveness thing i realized that people are even more scared of me um and I felt even more left out than I ever was because people did not want to interact with me. But as the years went by, <clears throat> I I started to create friends and friends that didn't really care about my different, you know, religion and and kind of uh culture, cultural religion if if you want to if if I if I may say um they didn't see that and so they they started becoming friends with me and those friends had really uh, a huge impact on me um i remember that i remember i think i was nine years old when or eight i think eight or nine can't really vividly remember my friends convinced me of giving my life to islam and I was convinced with that idea because the population around me was mostly Muslim people. And I was kind of convinced that Islam was a lot more powerful than Christianity. Um, probably because of the country that I lived in, um, the people that I, that I was just with. And I was just like, Christianity is not the way. But who was I to judge that? I was just a kid and I didn't even understand what Islam was or Christianity. So anyways, I gave in. I was, there was a mosque inside of school and I went inside of school. Um, inside the mosque. But before I, I entered the mosque, um, my friends were telling me, hey, you, you need to wash your hands and feet before you come inside. And that, that was like their tradition of, it's not a tradition, it's, it's kind of like a religion thing that they have to do wash their hands and feet before they get into the mosque. And so I started washing my hands and I, I washed my feet. And as I was washing my hands and washing my feet, I 
started to realize like, wow, if I actually do this, what would my parents, how would my parents react if I tell them that? And so I kind of moved on through this idea. I was just like, you know what? I don't have to tell them. It's not going to matter. So I went inside the mosque. And as we're about to start praying, and as I'm about to really just give in to that, this guy comes in the mosque and he looks at me and because he knows I'm a Christian and he he looks at me and he's like, what are you doing? And um, I tell him, I'm, I'm about to about to give my Islamic prayer. I, I want to I wanna be a Muslim. He's like, no, you can't. You need to leave this mosque. Um, and then I, I was in complete shock and, and I went outside and my friends were still in the mosque and they just kind of left me and I was there and, and I thought to myself, like, why? Like, I wanted to do it, but it didn't happen. And, and so although I still had friends, um, it still, I still felt left out. I still felt just very, very broken. And, um, when I was 10 years old, I, I was sitting alone at night one time and it was dark. I was sitting in the living room at my house and all of a sudden this fear crept in, creeped in inside of me. And I heard this voice and it was saying, you're going to die. You're going to die. And I was so afraid of that voice. And I felt like I'm going to die. I, I, and I, and I felt this suicide, almost the spirit of suicide was stirred inside of me. And it was telling me to kill myself. Luckily, I, I went to my parents and I told them that and I told them, hey, like, I, I feel this way. And I, and I heard this, I heard this, I heard this voice and it, and it was telling me that you're going to die. And my parents were like, no, you're not going to die. Don't worry. Like, everything is OK. Like, we're here. But they didn't understand the seriousness that I was that I was in and, and, and the deep guttural fear that I was in I was and at the ages of 11 um it was um it was a moment I was I was at school and um it was it was an after kind of school thing and buses usually come park inside of school because they pick up kids to take them home the reason why buses won't park outside of school property is because kids usually run around and so they don't want the kids to get hurt and so they prefer to have the buses parked inside of school. And so one of the buses was leaving school property. And um, my friends and I, we were playing tag. When all of a sudden this um, bus driver hits me from my back. And I, and I completely get thrown to the right side. My whole body's on the right side. And my left foot is facing the wheel. And as, as he's driving, he slowly runs over my foot. And um, he obviously wants to know what he ran over. And instead of getting out of the bus and checking what he ran over, he backs up again. Which is horrible. <laughs> I'm laughing at the story as I'm like imagining it now. And so... As I'm starting to realize what just happened in the moment, I just scream in excruciating pain of not even being able to get up. And so fast, uh, fast forward through the story, <clears throat> I call my dad and they transfer me to the hospital. You can't really call it. I mean, there is an ambulance over there, but it's not as as. Uh, as of a luxury as uh, as it is here where they come in and they rush and, and all that. Um, so it would be faster for my dad to come and just pick me up and take me to the hospital. And so we go to the hospital and 
the doctor speaks in front of me and in front of my dad and he says, your son has 30% oxygen in his foot. And for me, I don't understand what that means. All I know is that my foot is swollen. It, it looks huge and it just, it looks disgusting. And I wanted to go back to normal because I'm in so much pain. And so the doctor grabs my dad on the side and he tells him, you need to sign a, a paper that says that if the surgery does not go well, that we might have to amputate your son's foot. And so I can't even imagine my dad being in that position where he's having to sign a paper to basically um, change my life. And so there's a 50-50 chance. And so I go to the operating room and what's so crazy is this uh, Saudi Arabian nurse. He, he, he's with me. He's holding my hand as we're going to the operation room. I've never, never had surgery in my life. Age is 11 having surgery, uh, bust ran over my foot. I'm just like, my brain is, is just right now going 60 miles per hour. I'm just, what is happening? And, and it, it's like, it's going so fast. Like it's, it's like my brain is going so fast, but I, it's like, I'm not processing what the heck is happening. And so the nurse, he holds my hand and, and, uh, he kind of sees the paper and he notices that I'm a Christian and and then he tells me this, he tells me, and, and keep in mind, he's not a, he's not a Christian. And he, he, he looks at me and he tells me, Hey, aren't you a Christian? And I was like, yeah. And then he was like, well, why don't you pray? And then I was like, okay. And so he told me, you know, by then I'm in, I'm in the, I'm in the operation room and they're starting to put me to sleep. And he's like, just close your eyes and pray. And so I close my eyes and I start praying. And I completely fall asleep. I wake up and I see that my foot is there. Thank God. And then I go back and I go back to the room. They have a specialized room for me. And I see so many people in the room. And these people were praying and interceding for me while I was in the operation room for almost four hours. But the, um, the medicine where they put you to sleep is starting to fade away. And as it's fading away, my, I'm starting to realize that because they have to open my foot. I'm starting to realize the pain that I'm actually in right now. And so as the medicine is fading away, I'm starting to realize that. And so they, um, I, I, as I'm starting to realize that pain, I tell my dad, like, look, I know these people are here for me and they prayed for me and all that but I really need everyone to leave. And so they leave. And um, I couldn't even sleep at night from the pain that I was in, even though I took painkillers. The excruciating pain was, was like just so much. And my mind was just running so fast. I'm so angry. I am so confused. I am so lost why this is all happening to me and i'm just like i do not deserve this like i just deserve to just be a normal kid who wants a normal life who just wants to grow up normally just like every other kid and so the next day i don't sleep well i, I wake up a little grumpy and i ask my mom this question that just goes through my mind and i ask her this question it was just me and my mom in the, in the room. And I tell her, if God is so loving and all that he wants for his people is good, why would he do that to me? And my mom looked at me and she paused and she was like, she saw the anger in my face. And she told me, honey, God doesn't allow bad things to happen but you should ask him what is happening because he's the only one that could give you the best answer. I can't give you the best answer. And so she leaves the room and I'm in the room alone. And I start yelling so hard at God. And I told him, why would you do this to me? Why can't you just leave me alone? 
Why can't you just let me be normal like every other kid? Why do I always have to be different? Ever since the day that I was born, I was different. And in that moment, I had a flashback of so many events in my life. And I looked back at those events. The first time I almost experienced death was when I, was a, when I drowned in a swimming pool at age of six. And then at ages eight, a bus almost ran over me completely. And then at the ages 11, or sorry, at the ages 10, I wanted to kill myself with a knife in the kitchen. And at the, at the age of 11, a bus ran over my foot. And it was like God in this moment just, just gave me this whole flashback of my life and how much the enemy just wanted to take my life away. And from that moment, I knew that I had a purpose. And I heard this small, tiny voice when I thought that God's voice was so big and so, so deep. His voice was so sweet and it was so peaceful. And he told me this. He told me, I love you. And I broke down here. In the, in, in, I, I broke down in, in the room and, and I was just sitting and I was, I just I completely cried and I cried. And I was like, like, thank you, God. Like, thank you even through this whole process of just being in so much pain at just ages 11 you were able to keep me safe and you were able to, to protect me through all those events. And so after the, uh, after my bus accident, he, um, God, uh, God moved my family to the U.S. The reason why my family wanted to move to the U.S. was because of the education. Education there in Saudi Arabia was, um, you can't go to, go to college there if you're a Christian and you're not Saudi Arabian and just this whole thing. And so my sister's a lot older than me. And so she needed a place to go to college and especially that she's a woman and Christian and, and not Saudi Arabian. That just made it really messy. And so we were just like the best, um, the best place to move is, is here. And we couldn't go back to Egypt with, because we, it was during the Egyptian revolution in 2000 and, uh, 2012 through 2014, 2014 when we moved here. And uh, when we came here, I started to know more about God and I started to know more about that there is a Holy Spirit that lives inside of us and, and that if we accept God as a Lord and Savior, that He will dwell in us. And so I started to find out all uh, find find out all of these things and in 2015 I gave my life completely to Christ when I experienced God in such a supernatural way I was in a I was in a a worship uh worship setting um in a place called Pi Hop Pasadena International House of Prayer for y'all if if y'all know this uh, place um this is the place to go for honestly worship um and during the worship time, I felt these hands that were being put on my chest. And, and that was the first time I ever experienced um, God just moving in me supernaturally. And he's actually just meeting with me face to face. If we think God is so far away, he's not. He's closer than our breath, which is so crazy to think about. And I felt just his hands on my, on my chest. But there was one thing that really just kind of also affected me through my um, puberty years, if uh, if I may say. Um, my dad was had to still work in Saudi Arabia, and so I didn't really have a man role model in my life. I was always just told by by, by my dad that I'm the man of the house, and right now I have to take care of my mom and my sister, and so I always felt like I was. Um, I was leading and I was, I felt like I was always the one taking care of them. And, but during that time, I wasn't really affected by it because I knew that I was born different. And I accepted that reality because we are all actually born different. It's not just me. We're all just born different. And we're all just born in such a beautiful way. 
And so my dad being away really affected me. And sometimes at night I would cry because I really missed him and I would really just want a man to look up to. Up until God really spoke to me and, and I would just take my quiet time every single day, obviously not every single day of my life, but every single day. And, and, I, and, and, he, and, and when God spoke to me, he told me, I am your role model. I am the person that you should look up to. I am the man. I'm the man that I'm going to, I'm going to put you and I'm going to set you an example for the men out there. And so I was, I accepted that and, and I started to get even closer to God and I started to read the word and I was so hungry for God and I, and I was just digging, digging, digging deep and, and God was really just moving in my life and he was completely just transforming it 180 degrees. And, um, and here I am today, like, just, um, I'm not perfect, to be honest with you. I'm not perfect. I still go through my struggles. I still am so imperfect. I'm so far away from that. And I will never reach that in my lifetime, um, for me to be able to be perfect. I still lack, I still sin, I still fall. But really what God is teaching me in this season is how to be his, his son, I'm not Pierre the drummer, I'm not Pierre the minister, I'm not Pierre the whoever all of these things are because those things are good but they're not what defines who I am in God's eyes. I'm his son and I just wanted to just encourage you guys with this testimony and and just want to just really awaken everyone's heart to really really realize that God is not looking for your perfection. He's not looking for you to be perfect. He's not looking for you to come in your perfection. He's not, he, he wants you as you are. He wants you with your disgustingness. He wants you with your messiness. He wants you with all of this, all of this junk. He wants it all. One of the things that I learned, the difference between living in Saudi Arabia and living here that has really affected me was the worship. Don't take your worship for granted. Because when I lived in Saudi Arabia, we had to rent these tents for um, kind of this small uh, Christian community at um, in Saudi Arabia. And, and when we worshiped in these tents, when the owner would come, we would pretend like we never worshiped. And so I really wanna just encourage you, don't take your worship for granted. Understand that all of these battles that are happening in the world are not from Ephesians 6 12. It says for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities, against spiritual powers. And so our prayers and intercession. When you start interceding for other people and when you start praying for them and when you start just just do what Jesus did. You are defeating spiritual realms of, of things above them. So don't take your worship for granted. Don't, don't take anything for granted. Just live in the moment. Live in the moment of just wanting to pursue God. As you're going to class, as you're, as you're going inside of class, you're not just kind of forced to go to class because, because you go to school. You're going to class because you want to glorify the name of God. You want to learn something to to put something out there in the world to, to share the light of Christ and to share the love of God. And so I just wanted to encourage everyone and I wanted to um, just encourage everyone who, who has their testimony. Your testimony matters and it's, it's not just a, I get, I, Vanguard goes by this motto of like your story matters and it really does like, just let, just let SFD know or just let anyone know, let Alpha know that you want to share your testimony and you want to just really want to let people know what God did in your life because that is such an encouragement. There is, a, there is power in your testimony. There is so much power in it. And so I just really encourage you to, to just um, consider that and to really share that because that could change not not necessarily hundreds of people's lives, but it could just change one person's life. And that's all that matters. And so 
I just wanted to thank you for, for taking the time to listen to my testimony and to listen to what God is doing in my life and uh, is still doing in my life. Um, just thank you so much. And I want to thank us, uh, us SFD um, department for letting me do that and share that and um, giving me that platform to do so. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much and have an amazing, amazing day. Thank you.